thank you. Uh, I'd like to start with a little anecdote, so why I got to this. Uh, the thing is that I'm really like useless stuff, like the Pokemon cards I have and I don't really play because I don't really like, uh, Art, um, Haskell, that was a joke. <laughs> so at some point, so at some point in my career, people was like, oh, math is kind of use, useless for uh, computer science, for, especially for programmers. So especially the kind of more abstract things that I like. So I thought to myself, yes, that's exactly what, I, what I'm going to do. I will study math because it's useless. But to my surprise, it's actually useful. And I will show you some concepts that will help you improve your code. So uh, I'm April. I'm on the internet like CyberGlot almost everywhere, except for Medium, someone stole my handle. That happens. So the agenda for today is to talk about op optimizations as uh, refactoring. So we can use math to rewrite our code to a better version, to a more efficient version. We also going to talk about uh, optimization as code transformations. So these transformations are made by a third party, like the compiler or a library or uh, a DSL, an embedded DSL that you're running. And at the end, we are talk a little bit about how these this, uh, optimizations enable parallelism. So the tools I'm going to use here are basically two, uh, equational reasoning and category theory. And let's start with a very simple um, equational reasoning uh, code. So we have a list. This probably is, lots of you have done this before. This syntax kind of does not exist in Haskell, but it's something like this in JavaScript, where you pipe all your, your map to a function. And uh, if we take all the, the functions we are mapping into named functions, we can rewrite it just by uh, calling the, the function's name. We know that, simple stuff. But we can also do this. We can compose them before uh, running the, the, the map. We don't need to run the map three times. We can run it just one time, composing all the three functions. So you may be asking yourself, does that work in Haskell? Well, it turns out it does. But it does, does it work in JavaScript? Well, sometimes. But, 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 but why it doesn't work in JavaScript? It's because of pure functions. In Haskell, we have like a good chunk of the functions we work every day are pure. So we can guarantee that when we are composing them uh, via map or outside map, they are, we'll get the same result. But lots of people talk about pure functions, but it's hard for us to like, know exactly what people mean when they, they say pure functions. So here I'm using this definition, that a, a pure function is any function that can be properly memoized. There's anyone here who does not know what a mem memoization is? You can raise your hand. Well, I, I just see a few. But uh, basically, you create a table with the arguments and the results. So rather than uh, running the function again, you just given the same uh, arguments, you re just return the value you already computed. So if you can do that without your program exploding, that means your function is pure. So this is the case for this transformation. So rather than having 
three maps, you can have just one map and composing all the functions. So that is a good thing because we can improve algorithmic uh, complexity using pure, pure functions. So the basic idea is we have the original specification of the algorithm, we make some transformations in that code, and then we end up with a more efficient version of our code. So let's start with a very well known uh, problem, which is to get like the maximum segments in, meaning that uh, we need to compute, given this list, which segment, if we sum, which of them uh, gets get the the, the bigger sum. So I've already done this. So it's the segment and the sum is 187. So how would you approach this problem? Well, first we start with the most obvious solution. So we get a list of all segments. Uh, in each list, we calculate the, the sum, so we will have a list of all sums. And within that list, we, we get the, 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 the biggest value. So basically, that's the code we want. We want to compose all the segments, sum those, those segments to get just one value and then get the, the max of them. Cool. So the two, the two and three sub, it was kind of easy for us to get very straightforward functions. But how do we get a list of all segments? So I had an idea. So what I want is uh, the sags, the first code. Given the list one, two, three, I want this with all the segments. And how I can do it is by creating these two other functions in its entails. And they will get different versions of that list. Basically, what it needs, does is it takes the first element and start creating bigger lists by adding one more. Tails is the same thing, but in reverse. So it turns out if I map tails in a list of inits, I get exactly what I wanted. It does solve the problem, but the, 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 the thing is, is that the complexity we have now is cubical, which is not great. So I decided to play a little bit with, um, with uh, equational reasoning. So I have my uh, first definition, which is a max, max of map the sons and tag. So I can unfold segments and then replace the, the, the map of sum with the flattening it with two maps. And after that, I can put the map inside and do lots of other stuff and remove one of the loops. So with that, I could move from complexity cubicle to just uh, square complexity, which is good, but uh, we can do better. So we're going to use another tool for that. So we're not doing extremely weird stuff, just weird stuff. So monoids, we all know them and love. So a monoid is just, it just requires a, a binary operator, a left and right identity, and it requires all this to be associative. So we kind of all know them from like multiplication and uh, addition. And I love monoids because every time I have a problem, they are there to solve it for me. So here we're gonna learn a new concept on top of monoids, which is monoid homomorphism. What is that? That basically means that, uh, that given that we have two monoids, uh, the first one being it ranges over a set or type S, 
and the second one ranges over a set or type T. We have the, the binary operation, this circle plus, and the other, the circle uh, cross, and the, the identity D and E. So a monoid homomorphism is a function that I can map one monoid into other, that uh, this, law, this law holds, the sense that uh, if I apply the, the, the monoid to, the, to X and Y in one monoid, it's the same as distributing it. So that's how we, we define monoid homomorphism. It should be not as hard to, to get that. So, going back to our problem, uh, given that we have this monoid, we can transform this two-fold left and the map and the tails into just one fold, uh, right? With this third binary operation that just use something that looks like a monoid homomorphism within an identity. This law exists in math, but for polynomial, polynomials, it's called Horn's rule. So we are reusing something that it should be simple math into this. That means that I can rewrite some of my code with that. And uh, I put the, 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 the fold in my new binary operator. And also, it, if I map this fold with init, it's the same as doing scan. scan. So basically, the solution to my problem is the max of scan of uh, that weird operator. So great, with equational reasoning category theory, we went from a cubical complexity to a linear one. You should clap now. <laughs> great, great, like, I didn't know math could help me with this. So it was great learning that. So, but now you're thinking, well, it's kind of hard to deal with just pure functions. I mean, you probably think, I work, so I need to, to perform effects. So, the good thing is that equational reasoning also works uh, under effects. But the problem with them is that we have less uh, equations to work with because the, the expressivity of effects is so big that we don't know. There is no generic way we can work with this. Basically, the only thing we have is associativity at best. But then there's this new thing that probably some of you may, heard, may have heard of, which, uh, which, are, which is called algebraic effects. It's a new thing that people are trying to rework uh, effects and introduce them in the better, more controlled way. So how it works is fairly easy. We have the sprint function, which is, which is just print something to the screen. So we print hello, and we have this printer, which is the handler. And then it prints the, what we want. So it looks, fairly like we used to with monads in Haskell. So this is basically what lots of people have been doing with uh, free monads, where you can interpret the effects the way you want. So rather than printing this to the screen, you could write another uh, handler and print it to I don't know, on the, of a file or something. So, but then you look at this and think to yourself, well, but where's the, the math here? Why are they called algebraic? They are defined like this. An algebraic effect has the signature where 
P is the parameters and N is the arity of the, the operation. So you look at that and like, wow, what is happening here? This is crazy. This emoji, uh, it's very much how I felt when I first saw this. But it's kind of not that hard. So basically, with the print effect, we can say that um, the parameters are string and the, the, the RIT of the return is just a uh, unit. So we can get like an effect that is a little bit more a little bit more interesting than print. We can take like mutable effect. We have the, the two operations we want, get and put, and uh, we can represent them algebraically like that. So you can see there are some sim similarities with put and printing. The difference that put is, is taking any type S while print is getting strings. So you could like abstract over there and just have put and, and a specific handler that only that converts S to a string. So, but the thing is that algebraic effects that are kind of like monads, which is great and not very great. The thing is, is that uh, Monads are great to express lots of things. We can basically write everything we want. But the problem is that we cannot play with them statically. So if there is a, a monad for the compiler, it's just a blob that we should deal with it with just a blob. I cannot do anything smart about it. So for instance, this code, I have this com complex computation and it returns an X. And if I uh, execute this conditional, the, the second computation will only be executed if the result is true. So both the data and, and the control flow are dynamics, are dynamic for monads. That's like an example of why monads are this blob that you cannot do because every information about it is tied to the, 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 the dynamic execution. But then you, especially if you have played with Haskell, you might be thinking to yourself, but are all effects monadic? So for the Hasklers, we have a little, a little friend called applicatives. They are, we can define them in terms of monads, which is basically run two things, get their values, and apply the function to the, to the second. Okay, great. What is about applicatives that make them different from uh, monads? The thing is that if we run this code as, a, as an applicative, the result we're gonna get is that it's gonna print five, 10, and return unit. So the thing with applicatives is that they will run the two steps regardless of, uh, of the control flow or the, the data that is coming in which is good because now, because now we can analyze our code and learn things about it statically. But then we arrive into this problem where uh, the algebraic effects are monadic. What are we gonna do now? I mean, how we're gonna find a way to handle uh, applicatives. So then we think of non-monadic algebraic effects. So here we, may, we meet monoids again. Uh, it turns out that both applicatives and monads, they form a, a monoidal category. 
and the, what we need to, to deal with both monads and applicatives is a free monoid. And uh, you may not react reacting very nicely to this because you may be thinking, what the hell is a free monoid? The other day was just like free monads, now I have other things that are free. So usually when people say free and whatever structure, they mean that we're gonna get the purest version of that structure. They, it won't have any other properties. For example, we have, we have this monoid, which is the, the natural numbers, um, plus, and the identity zero. So we have a free monoid here. But then um, I had an idea. So what if we get to, to get numbers to just like hold a variable with them. So we can create a pair with a number and whatever variable. But this looks kind of familiar for some reason. So yeah, lists are kind of the canonical free monoids for computer scientists. So they the good news is that we knew free monoids all along because we've been playing with them for a long while. So now we get to a more tricky part, which is actually creating a structure that is a free, mo uh, a free monoid. So we define it like that, kind of the way we used to define uh, free monoids. And then we can use another data structure based on a functor composition. If you have a look, the types uh, of this data type look exactly like the, the bind operator. So if we add that uh, in the position of the T, we get a free monad. And if we do the same, but with day, but with day, with day, we get free applicatives. So for some effects, we have a good thing that we can go back and forth between monads and applicatives. So for someone who's into the theory behind this, we have a, a joint uh, functors that which is basically the identity functor that can go back and forth from monads and applicatives. So this is, when I learned this, I was, my mind was blown because I was like, wow, so now I can kind of play with this and try to exploit a thing that I can understand and I think that I cannot, so I can play with that. Oh, a bonus thing that for the Hasklers in the, in the audience, arrows also form a monoid uh, category, meaning that you can also uh, write a data structure and have a free arrow. And as I said, uh, applicatives can be statically analyzed, so you can analyze your code. For instance, if you have a state, and handle with, with applicatives, you can count the number of additions and whatever you've been doing within your state. So I'm gonna stop all this conversation about um, category theory to talk about parallelism. Every time I talk about parallelism, people are usually confused what it is, and the, the usually what I get is, well, this is, something uh, related to concurrency, right? Well, it can be, but in my case, I like to see parallelism as uh, an evaluation strategy. Uh, usually in programming languages, when we are evaluating computations, they are evaluating in sequence. But let's assume we have this function f that takes three, uh, three arguments. Before we get to run the, the function, we need to evaluate A 
then B, then C, like one after the other. It's true for most computations because usually we don't know what's going to be in each one of those, uh, of those computations, but we learn about pure functions and how they're great and we can play with, that, with them a little bit. So if A, B, and C are pure computations, we can run them in parallel. But not only that, if they do not affect the outside world, they can also be run uh, in parallel. So here are, for parallelism, we usually work with uh, what is called uh, skeletons, which are schemes of how you, the best strategy to parallelize uh, hard, uh, large chunks of data. The most common of them are map and, and fold. So every time you have a map over a large set, it is an opportunity to run it in parallel. The same for fold. So I'm going to use, so I'm going to present you a real world uh, case that I've been working on, which is a programming language for generative R. That's the useless joke again about generative R. So what are the, 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 the minimal requirements for a, a programming language for generative R? Pure functions. I want to save the configurations of what I'm doing have some sort of uh, third party that will give me some sort of uh, random output. And I want to, after I'm done, I want to save my, my art. So basically, what we want is to draw to a canvas, get a, a random number, and look up values from a context. So we have uh, the canvas effect with an operation uh, draw in an initial state, which is blank, which is just a transparent canvas. And uh, here is when you, you combine two canvases. So combining them with, um, with blank will get us the, the, the one with the star because a, a blank canvas is an identity. And if we combine two canvas, we get the third one with the, the two components uh, merged. And it's also associative. What that means is that this kind of effect is also a monoid. Yay, here they are again. So that means that uh, the canvas effect can be processed as a, in a fold. So I can potentially work with this in parallel. Uh, context and random are kind of boring because, for instance, here, it doesn't matter the, the, the order in which I read from the, from the context. It's, I will get the same observable uh, result from this. But at least they are commutative. They are boring, but they have a good property. So which means that I can basically map them all and run them in parallel, because they are not uh, stuck uh, into an order. But uh, the monoidal effect, they kind of need this uh, to be in order, but they are associative, so I can parallel fold them all. So here's an example of a code really written in this language. This is a simple um, random walk that uh, it walks in the random positions and draw a line. And then here's a more involved uh, version that creates a triangular mesh. So here you can see um, that I use all the, 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 the effects, the lookup, the, the random list, 
and the drawing. So there is a bonus to all of this is that uh, generative uh, programs are uh, hylomorphism, which means that I can, hylomorphisms basically unfold, compose with fold. So I can go from a, a blank image to a finalized art, which means that I can run, I can get to fold in parallel many times during that, so enable way more uh, parallelism than I, I would usually get. So the takeaways from this talk is that uh, you should, uh, learning the, 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 the equations of the, of the functions we use every day is cool, so then we can, rather than applying map three times, we can apply map just once and just compose all the functions in the middle. So we can reduce uh, complexity and also enable the, the compiler to play with parallelism. And pure functions, we should strive to get them always or as frequently, frequent as possible. And that sometimes we can get parallelism for free just by playing with some math and pure functions. So, um, just to plug this in, I am doing this uh, zines that uh, I explained programming with uh, math. So they will be freely available for everyone. So you can follow me on Twitter, I'll be sharing them. If you like this talk and you want to see more, you can uh, support me on Patreon. That's it, thank you very much.